we're here for the next edition of the All Things Facades podcast, and we're here with Samir Kumar. And Samir it has a unique uh, background here because he has been with some of the notable, uh, very high-end architecture firms, specifically, though, a facade and enclosure specialist. So today, I want to pick his brain on all things facades, but specifically, really, the integration of design and performance um, from a facade standpoint and how that sort of communication is bridged between the subcontractors and the design team. Uh, so Samir, thanks for coming on. I'll give you a chance to introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, so as you already started saying, I am an architect and I'm a facade specialist. And I have been in the world of facades in New York City since I think 2003, which is when I started working for Heinges and Associates. Uh, I eventually uh, spent several years at KPF and then several years at Shop. Um, at Shop, I was the director of uh, enclosure design for about eight years, and I was uh, involved with every single project that came out of that office during that time. And then um, in early 2022, I uh, founded my own uh, facade consulting practice called Techne. I'm now basically, uh, you know, in early stages of developing this practice, which uh, I hope to sort of bring together all of my past experience and knowledge and, and put it in the service of helping um, more architects and more owners and uh, more projects sort of uh, come to success. You know, I, I appreciate the, the, the platform here, um, but I think in a way, if I had to define what, what I most enjoy, what what drives me the most, is um, is solving the complex puzzle that every single project is when it comes to facade. And every single project has its own specific pieces that fit with each other in a very specific way. And the identification of these pieces happens during the course of design and continues into the course of uh, construction uh, phases with the contractors and. Um, I think I have uh, found success uh, by being open-minded and by being um, uh, curious and um, and let us just say uh, not with any preconceived notions approaching a project and finding uh, its own value within itself. So it's it's interesting. I didn't realize that you came from Heinches. So you actually started with a sort of a side technical background. And when you decided to go to the design community, were you proactively approaching or accepted as sort of that enclosure specialist? At that time, were the architecture firms looking for specialists? So one thing that you said to me is that architecture is not a monolith. And I think as an outsider, you know, you make all these assumptions about how firms operate and every team has specialists or you have specific specialists in the offices. So what, what have you found over time? Um, are these architecture firms trying to niche out and, and um, really uh, sort of build out specific teams to have uh, specialties in specific areas, or um, is there sort of a, just a general broad knowledge base throughout the office? Um, it changes, it varies uh, from firm to firm. Um, in general, I would say that architecture as a profession still has um, a little bit of a difficult time dealing with specialists. Uh, I think that uh, there is there continues to be sort of an, an unspoken, um, let us call it uh, an unspoken deliberation going on within the firms uh, that see um, generalization as one aspiration of a good architect and specialization as a completely opposite end of that spectrum. And companies, uh, and there is this sort of a, a, a long standing. Um, idea of what an architect is and what an architect is supposed to do, which tends to, you know, a more traditionalist approach tends to take people more towards generalized uh, uh, sort of wide ranging knowledge, but not super deep versus I definitely fall into the category where I have narrow knowledge, but extremely deep, you know, deep study. And and um, I, of course, with my own bias, I, I do believe that architecture is a profession has room and actually has a need for deep studies because we have so much 
uh, we have to cover so much ground in in uh, in a sh relatively short process of designing a project that we must um, uh, we must not only rely on people with deep knowledge, but we might we we will do well to have people who solve similar pro problems project to project so that the learning can happen from one project to another to another. So it's yeah, it's funny. I I, I wonder what the experience was like at Heinz's because when I was at uh, Israel Berger uh, Associates of Bedaris, there were specialists in specific area, curtain wall specialists, uh, brick specialists, existing building, rain screen. You really had sort of that divide and conquer approach, and then you'd have knowledge sharing throughout the office. But that's just in the facade industry itself. Then you go to architecture, and it's overwhelming for me to think that. Architects are expected to understand the facade, then go to the waterproofing, then go to the mechanical, then go to the interiors. And it's just, for me, yeah, it, it would be- structure and, and everything, yes. Yeah, so uh, exactly, it is a very wide field. And I think that uh, architecture does have uh, sub-disciplines within it, and architecture does have specialists, uh, whether, whether many architects would like to acknowledge or not. For example, project management within an architecture office in my mind is specialization. Good project managers, architects, they do need to have generalist understanding of all portions, but they also ideally should have a good training as a project manager, right? Project management is not something that people are born with. Project management is a, a method, it, it is a skill that needs to be acquired and people who spend time doing project management do become specialists, even though uh, architects would argue that a project management role is that of a generalist uh, within an architecture practice. But but these are sort of uh, sometimes semantics and sometimes uh, sort of a um, endless discussion. What I can tell you is that after spending uh, over five years at Heinz's, when I was um, sort of at a crossroad in my in my career, I was enjoying being a facade specialist immensely. I I could tell that I would be happy doing it for the rest of my life, but I had not yet worked as a mainstream architect, and you know, which was the original dream that I had gone to architecture school with. I I, I specifically sought out uh, a position after Heinz's uh, at KPF at that time, um, uh, which KPF were very clear about it on day one. They said we do not hire specialists, and we will not be hiring you as a specialist. And we appreciate your background, but you would come here and you would join the architectural staff like any other architect, which is exactly what I was looking for. Because for me, learning about the technicalities of building facades was, uh, in my mind, a stepping stone towards becoming a better designer. And so I had to sort of test it out for my own self, go to go to an architecture firm uh, uh, and, and see if, if this special knowledge that I had was going to help me in any way. Interestingly enough, uh, while I was at KPF, I performed many roles. I did project management, I did job captaincy, I did, uh, I led facade teams within bigger teams like the 10 Hudson Yards team or uh, the Hyundai Tower um, in Korea, which wasn't built, or even the Lotte Tower. I was a part of, uh, you know, the Lotte World Tower at KPF uh, where the facade, it was the first project where we used Grasshopper to solve the, the geometry of the surface. Um, but during that time, um, I, I did not have a title that acknowledged my facade expertise, but de facto, I was a sort of an in-house resource for the whole office and everyone knew it. And I, I, would, I would have lectures for, for my colleagues. I would train them. I would uh, help teams that I was not working on with selecting glass or with uh, solving complex detailing problems. And I was also sort of the de facto face of KPF to the facade industry and the glass industry. And they would all reach out to me if they needed to connect with someone at KPF. So I had sort of never let go of my specialized uh, underpinning uh, while being at KPF. I was there for over six years. And I actually learned how to use this advanced knowledge about a specific field in a valuable manner in early stages of design conversation. So the early stages of design conversation uh, within, a, within a mainstream design firm are, are somewhat unique. That's something that um, a facade consultant doesn't deal with ever, doesn't participate in ever. And I had to develop that skill of how to not sound uh, completely um, out of tune, you know, how to not sound like a, a 
naysayer or a uh, one trick pony, you know, every time I would start talking. But in the process, I kind of uh, understood and I, uh, I discovered what value I could bring with, with my advanced knowledge on one hand, but also my ability to, to talk at concept stages. And so then I actually sought out the position at Sharp after that, because I, I sort of, you know, at, uh, towards the end of my stay at KPF, I kind of knew that I, I wanted a position that was specifically acknowledging my facade expertise. I, I had sort of come to a realization that I could become a project manager, I could become a job captain, I could do any of these pre-existing roles, and it wasn't difficult, but I would do it at the expense of my first love, which was my building enclosure um, sort of specialty. And, and did you feel like it was not being embraced at that time within the firm? I mean, not not advertently, but uh, I think that eventually you know that if the firm does not acknowledge you as an expert in enclosures within, then the world outside will have difficulty acknowledging you as that. And and I sort of you know I uh, I wanted some of that. I wanted I wanted to to. Uh, continue my focused development, continue to build my relationships in the industry and all of that. And I, most importantly, I felt like, um, I felt like involving myself with multiple projects at the same time, as opposed to one project, which is the, the nature of working in an architecture office, you're on one project for three, four, five years, whatever it takes. I felt like um, enclosures, you know, when I was at Hindus, I was on 10 projects at a time. And I felt that the learning, the, the, the conversations that happen across projects at the same time where new ideas are te being tested out in different ways across different uh, design problems was actually uh, something to, to seek out. And so um, I, at the, you know, this was in 2014 and um, Shop Architects was just starting to become well known uh, after the Barclays Center and they were on a growth um, trajectory and I was very interested in the work that they were creating and so I approached them and I um, and I uh, sort of floated the idea that I could come in as a as a facade expert and uh, this was not a job opening that they had they had never had one before and they weren't necessarily looking for one at that time either but they were intrigued by my approach and they and we spoke for many months and we developed the idea of a director of facades which was new for them and um, we continued the development of that idea of how to organize knowledge resource within the company and how to uh, properly um, ensure that projects while being um, progressive in, in terms of their design approaches were also being designed correctly and were being uh, drawn in a, in a way that the problems were being solved or that we were not creating uh, minefields for contractors down the line. That whole exercise, which is in, in my mind was a project in itself, you know, which, which I participated in for over eight years, um, was a phenomenal time. You know, that is where I was able to bring together technical knowledge about facades, plus uh, an ability to evaluate um, you know, concept ideas and develop visions of success, uh, you know, visions of trajectories of success, like how, you know, what are the potential pitfalls of a design approach uh, and how do we de-risk this gradually during the, the process of design? How do we set this up for success? How do we, you know, and for me, you know, success uh, has come to mean something very simple. A successful project is the one where every stakeholder, including the architect and the owner and the general contractor and the facade subcontractor, they all must be successful. If the subcontractor doesn't make money in a project, that project is not a successful one, right? And so it is only when uh, I, uh, it is only when a subcontractor uh, finds it, it's a good looking project and they're gonna make a killing on it, will they put their best resource behind it? And that is what we need, right? We, we need full motivation that they do their best work on our project. And for that, we must ensure that, uh, that they have no reason to hold back. So, so where do you and, and that actually made me go on a different sort of thought pattern after you said that when you see a separate design architect to architect of record, 
do you feel like that design architect has skin in the game? I mean, I'm trying to think about that relationship you just described between a design architect getting to see their design come to fruition through the actual installed project um, and then having that sort of positive working relationship with the facade contractor. But do you see this once that DD phase is over and it moves to CDs and then the actual CA phase, it kind of gets turned or passed over to the architect of record and they sort of lose skin in the game? How does that relationship work? Um, I can safely say that on every project that I was involved in, whether it was at KPF, where we were doing projects all over the world, or it was at shop, where also we were doing projects all over the world, where, you know, I have, uh, while at shop, we did this really beautiful project in Melbourne, Australia. We were doing this extensive project in Botswana and Africa. We were doing this uh, project uh, in, we were doing a number of OBO US embassy projects, etc. But we were also doing a project in Vietnam at that time. And um, so, and in many of these situations, we were at a position of design architect. But in all, in all the cases, we would have a transition from, as you said, from DD to CDs, where the responsibilities was, which would move away from us as design architects towards our executive architects, except for the facade. And the facade was always something, you know, for KPF, what is standard was that they would hold the facade as well as the public areas of the building. So uh, it would be the, the lobby and the elevator lobbies uh, and maybe the bathrooms, et cetera, in a core and shell office building. Uh, but we would always ensure that we would be in, involved across the entire process of design and delivery of the facade. We, uh, we never really drew a, a schematic or an early DD level facade and gave it a way for someone else to solve. Even in case of uh, some of the OBO work that uh, Shock has been doing, and I as Techne, as my own company, I continue to be involved with all of that, um, where it is a design built uh, kind of a contract where, uh, uh, where the architects are only creating a bridging set and then a, a general contractor comes in with their entire um, design team and contractor team. Even there, OBO recognized that uh, shop was bringing a much higher level of knowledge and ability with facades, and uh, they created special room for for the shop facade team to continue being involved in a higher level than typically what uh, design build um, situations would uh, typically mean. So, so in that early in that early stage, when you're trying to think about it from an architect standpoint, when they're trying to pitch either design competition or pitch their design to an owner. Owner buys a property, he gets the zoning rights to build a 22 story tower. He goes out to three architects for pricing. How do, this is a very generic question, but how do architecture offices think about differentiating themselves? How much of it is about um, boasting your own design and trying to show off through that versus really thinking and hearing through what the owner wants. A, a lot of the clients that you were dealing with, did they care about how the skin looked? Was Did it all come down to cost? I mean, what were those metrics that you were really trying to measure and, and communicate across the end user? So um, I would say that, um, you know, you, you set out sort of a generic understanding of a design competition, basically, where a client uh, has a site and has a general idea of uh, maximizing the potential of that site, and they ask three architects how they plan to maximize the potential of the site, right? And uh, at that stage, it is unlikely that there would be very clear ideas of the physical representation of that building. At that time, it is a lot about, you know, um, how how do you, you know, what is calculating the, the zoning envelope, calculating the floor area ratios, and proposing a, a massing of a building which uh, sets out how the functions are set, you know, basically the stackings or or the programmatic arrangement, where the approach is, and you know, things like that. It's a more, it's a, at a more holistic level that that they are trying to understand what is a building that each of the architects is coming up with. And at that level, at that stage, uh, there would be different approaches on how you would make the buildings. So uh, just the site doesn't, uh, you know, it the, the the core value that an architect brings at that stage is that of um, creating sort of the first sort of a bubble diagram of, of, of a building. Um, typically, the, the materiality of the project comes uh, soon after, you know, once uh, the, the client says, okay, yes, this is this massing, this stacking of volumes or floor heights, uh, programs, et cetera, is, is uh, 
reasonable. Let's see what the building looks like. That is when uh, the architects, the team, the design team within an architecture firm would start to speculate on the materiality of the building, on the material expression. And these speculations are never uh, predetermined, right? They, we don't know what it's going to come out. And uh, sometimes it is senior level principals who sit and sketch ideas. And sometimes it is younger people, junior level staff, who start uh, throwing things together as if they're in a design studio in, in their college. Um, and uh, ideas emerge. A uh, lot, of, lot of these ideas may have um, imprints of uh, exercises that have been done on other projects that were interesting but were not used, or exercises that had been done on other projects which were used but not very successfully. And there is an opportunity here to hone that and make it even better or something like that. For example, the 10 Hudson Yards uh, KPF, you know, it was one of the first office buildings that KPF was doing in the US after a long run of doing a lot of projects abroad. And at that time, KPF had, uh, you know, mastered the quote and shell office building in, in many, many markets. And they were finally back in New York uh, with a real quote and shell office building. And uh, we came up with, uh, with this idea of doing a shingled facade, right? A shingled facade that 10 Hudson Yards uh, employed did not exist in New York for one simple reason. The requirement, you know, the Department of Labor requirement for tracked facade access for all buildings taller than 600 feet that basically imposes a vertical line or, or a flat line of the facade where the tracks are, where you can. And KPF had built shingled walls in Hong Kong. KPF had built shingled walls uh, in China. And we we're like, this is something new. New York has never done this. And we had to then, to succeed with the shingled wall, we had to actually solve the window washing track first, which is actually not a straight line. It is an S-shaped track. It's wow. And that so became, I've never gone over there. You can see a building maintenance unit dancing around the facade. Absolutely, because the, it is a concealed track. It's not a straight track that is put outside. The, it is concealed within the mullions, but the mullions are inclined and they do not line up floor to floor. So the track has to jump back and then come out and then jump back and come out. And that is pioneering for, for, for that time and for, for the project. So, uh, you know, that that sort of becomes the flavor of the project, it becomes a story of the project. And uh, it, it uh, so coming back, when, when you have four or five expressions in front of you that are all speculations of what this building could look like, that is when someone like me would say, okay, these are all valid expressions. Um, what is the reality of this project? What are the factors that are outside of the designer's purview? You know, there is a client who has a budget, there is a geographical location of the site, which implies what kind of marketplace you're in and what kind of subcontractors you have available. And that is also affected by the kind of budget or the position in the real estate market where this project is going to be located and potentially what kind of rents it will be able to command or what kind of um, what kind of value the, the, the owner expects to get out of it. And then you have to understand the regulatory environment and whether or not there are any acoustic requirements because you're next to a highway or something. And you you start bringing into the picture all of these factors to say, which of these seem to have a higher potential of success versus the other? At that same time, you're also saying, okay, you know, this particular rendering has a green expression to it. What is that green? It could be terracotta glazed. It could be pre-patinated copper. It could be painted aluminum. Um, which one is, uh, you know, each one comes with its own cost structure, procurement structure, its own, um, uh, its own um, sort of potentials and limitations. And you say, okay, what is right for this project? What is the bigger chance of success? And of course, architects do, will say that, okay, this, if there is one thing that becomes really important for me in this, is this green material and I want it to be terracotta, right? An architect can say that on day one and say, this is priority. And then say, okay, if we want this to be terracotta, if you want terracotta, how do we make room for an expensive material like that to come and become successful on this project. How can we then, you know, if necessary, how can we then reduce complexity in other places? Can we, because if you if you design a three-dimensional facade, which is a lot of ins and outs, they're always expensive. You have a lot of opaque area where you need 
multiple layers of uh, material, you know, insulation and waterproofing and interior sheathing, uh, interior uh, uh, galvanized uh, vapor barrier, on and on. Uh, uh, an opaque area is always higher cost value than a transparent vision area. So you're like, okay, I have I have these pieces to play with. I have those energies code to comply with. How do I um, find the right formula where terracotta is a given? How do I arrange everything else so that it starts fitting together as in a, in a holistic picture and become realistic for the project? Because one thing that is not lost on anyone starting the first day of the project is that you don't have a project if it is not financially viable, right? You cannot go down the path with your head in the sand and say, I'm going to keep designing this. I don't care whether someone can afford it or not. That is not the reality. Architects do not work in that in such a reality. I mean, That's an interesting thing that you just brought that up because something I wanted to talk to you about is, is and it sounds like, how, how cost conscious architects are during that early design stage. And I think somebody like you who has enclosure experience and can interact with beside subcontractors understands, okay, we're using terracotta. It's going to be a little bit more expensive. Maybe we could look at um, simulating it out of a, uh, at a precast or something. Maybe if we reduce the complexity of the in and outs in geometry, we lower that overall depth to the facade. So we lower the amount of material. So there are kind of wiggle rooms and toggles you could play with to get down that cost, but that's if you understand the right questions to ask. So do you feel like architects are in a position where they are interacting enough with the contracting community or do, do they rely on a bridge, whether it's the facade consultant or the GC to, to streamline that, that line of communication? So, so anyone who is working on projects like this must for their own sake must rely on some bridge, right? So shop, for example, for that duration had me and I was acting as that bridge. In case of KPF, we would always rely on our facade consultants to act as that bridge, right? Um, where we would say, you know, tell us if, if you see anything, you know, uh, outwardly here that that needs to be addressed before we go to bid. At shop, we had a very, uh, you know, especially once I came in and, you know, we, we started to develop a method. We had a method of how we approached our facade design. And a part of that method was preliminary pricing exercises. We had to do a preliminary pricing exercise at the end of 100% SD. And we had to put it in front of the client and have them react to it. And sometimes the clients would say, oh, you know, it seems a little high. I'm like, okay, so how much do you want down? 20%, 40%, what are we talking about? And they would say, okay, well, maybe 20% down and then we can keep going. So we would say, okay, um, we have a preliminary pricing. We have a design, 20% massaging, uh, we would do some changes and then we would reach back to the people who had done preliminary pricing, which was always people who were potential bidders, by the way. We would never do pre pre preliminary pricing through, an, through any estimator or through any anyone other than potential bidders, right? And these bidders would come back and say, thumbs up, it is going downwards or thumbs down. No, you just made it more expensive, right? So even a simple thing like we have a four and a half foot wide module I could bring down cost by switching to a six foot module just because you have reduced significantly the amount of aluminum mullions and I, you have reduced the number of units on the facade. You have increased the thickness of the glass a bit, but glass is cheap. You know, So there are a whole bunch of ways that you could massage the, the sort of uh, design in a way that will greatly affect logistics or that would greatly affect uh, the quantity of materials or something like that. And you're like, okay, I'm looking for 20% improvement. Do you think this is doing that? And they'd be like, well, I would say it's more like 10% right now. Like, okay. And then, so we would typically develop a, by 50% DD, we would do a second round of preliminary pricing, which in our mind needed to land plus minus five to 10% of the client, what made the client comfortable. And we knew that the bid will be five to 10% lower than whatever that number is, because bid number is always lower. Right, because that is when people sharpen their pencils and start actually estimating the cost. Till that time, preliminary estimates are always based on historical value, and we understand that it is done in two weeks. It is it is sort of gut feeling pricing, and uh, our goal was always that at the time of bidding, there should be no surprises, no surprise, no surprises in cost, no surprises in feasibility, no surprises in material sourcing or anything such which basically means that you have understood the risks ahead of time and you have de-risked them. And that was the design process for us. We would sit and de-risk the project. And when the bidding would happen, we had, you know, if we were able to 
we, uh, if we were able to be influential, we would have assembled a good um, pool of bidders, and we would, you know, we would be happy to go with either one of them, and then, you know, we would succeed uh, in terms of uh, not having to then do a VE exercise after the bidder is on board, not having to do, you know, after that we would go into system design or, you know, whatever you, you know, there are different words for it. But that that process of, of uh, rigor in design early on um, to, to tune, to fine tune the owner's aspirations, whatever they are, there are a multitude of them, and an architect's aspirations and the industry's aspirations. That fine tuning, the earlier that gets done, the more success we all have. I, I want to envision a multifamily building for conversation purposes. And you're dead set on a green, green glazed terracotta. That was your dream. You said, I'm not giving that up. So we could play with the depth or the window to wall ratio. An owner or your end user says, the, the owner says, I don't care. As long as you hit my budget, we could use that green glazed terracotta. What does he ultimately care about? How the skin looks from the exterior? Or are we thinking interior architect, how it feels when you walk in the apartments, because that's ultimately what he's going to be able to sell. What matters more? Um, so it's a very good question. And uh, it, it is also a very uh, important question um, because facades, more than any other component of architecture, actually have two faces and have two different functions, right? There is uh, the, the exterior of the facade, the exterior of the building, in my mind, belongs to the city. It is It shapes the urban experience of the city. It shapes the urban experience of the people on the streets. It changes the skyline of the city, and it creates, uh, it, it affects millions of people who will perceive that building from the outside over the course of its life. And that is a significant purpose. So when we're talking about the exterior of the building, uh, the, the evaluation is at an urban level, right? Uh, everything from how the building touches the ground to how the building touches the sky to, you know, what story it says between the ground and the sky and what it says when someone is walking up to it on the sidewalk versus someone looking at it from 20 blocks away from the top of a roof, all of it, right? So the exterior of the building belongs to the city. The interior belongs to the occupant. Occupants, it's super important, of course, you know, they we talk about occupants more as comfort for the most part, right? So we talk about performance as being the primary um, path to a successful experience for the for the end user. The other thing is functionality. You know, if you're putting a operable window, at what height does the handle exist, right? Is it, you can do a full height uh, floor to ceiling single operable. But if someone has to get on their knees to open and close it, then you know that's not that's not fair, you know. Or or if you're doing it a, a tilt, where uh, it's tilting up uh, outwards on on top, but you can only pull at 900 millimeters or three feet from the ground, and you can never get the enough pressure up on top to pull it in so that it can lock. Then you you have a failure there, right? So so there is the question of comfort. There is a question of you know how much blank wall do you have to put furniture against? How much blank, blank wall do you have to put a painting on? How much, uh, you know, how much of this uh, this interaction with the facade? You know, when, when we talk about residential building versus a commercial building, the interaction to the interior of the facade is radically different because an interior, uh, the, the, the residential building has say maximum 20 feet of, of a room, you know, 20 feet would be the deepest room approximately, but they're more like 10 to 12 feet. You are right up against the facade at all times. You're touching it. You're feeling it. In a commercial building, open floor plan, you have a 45 foot lease depth. Your closest desk might be three feet away from the facade, and you might have a walk around, you know, a, a walking area next to the facade just because of comfort, because it's too cold close to the facade, or, or because uh, of other things. So, so the relationship of the interior of the facade changes um, from function to function, and all of it comes into play. All of it comes into play. Uh, but more in sense of comfort, more in sense of functionality and all of that. When we talk about glazed terracotta, for example, it is entirely in the service of the city and the urban experience. It is not really about the interior um, experience. 
Well, if you go to the domino sh uh, sugar development, I mean, a lot of different materiality, whether it's unitized curtain wall with uh, a specialty tile or um, a copper metal panel finish or precast facade, but these are all facades, rental buildings with highly opaque area, but very, very, very successful facades. Um, where I go to a city like Vancouver and it's all curtain wall, all window wall. And I've talked to the design community and frankly, it's just been a lack of specialty contractors. So there are a few single, you know, uh, window wall, curtain wall contractors that just dominate the city. And so as somebody who's outside of the design community, in my eyes, I ask, is there just lack of creativity or expression? And I think it's just lack of availability. And cost is a matter, right? Because uh, building a all glass facade um, with very little spandrel or a window wall which has zero spandrel is the cheapest facade you can build, right? It is, and that is the reason why we have such a glut of all glass facades, because it's cheap. Um, and every time, you know, at shop, we were always uh, committed to having a material that was not glass be the story of that project, right? It was all, there was always a different material. Uh, glass was always a secondary material. KPF was different. KPF was comfortable doing all glass buildings, but shop was never super comfortable with that. So, and and these are just, uh, you know, cultural differences within, within design cultures. Uh, there is no better or worse, uh, uh, but at shop, we always, to, to bring in this other material, you know, to uh, another material that would, be as weather resilient as glass. So the reason why glass is so easy to use is because glass is one of the most inert materials that you can employ that does not change due to weather. It does not lose its sheen, its transparency, its coloration, nothing, right? Uh, glass is basically molten sand. Any form of cooked earth, right? Terracotta, um, um, ceramics, glass, all of these inherently are the most resilient materials that you can find that that humans have ever made. If you if you look at the oldest artifacts that are discovered um, from excavations from prehistoric times, they're terracotta pieces because cooked earth cannot be disintegrated even by earth itself, right? It it is the most resilient thing. Glass is the most resilient thing. It is uh, unique in its uh, properties. Um, not too many other materials are available as exterior uh, application that would last, right? So you could either go towards stone and the world of stone, you could go towards metals, but metals you have to do a lot of work to get them to not corrode, right? Because metals tend to corrode. Metals are not great with, with weathering, uh, but we have been able to overcome that because metals give such a fantastic weight to strength ratio that we can use so little of it to such great um, such great applications and we can do all sorts of things with it. So metals continue to be prevalent, extremely prevalent. And we do, you know, whether we are putting um, fluoropolymer coatings on it or whether we are putting them through, you know, cortinization, you know, the, the rusting or whatever we do to it to make it uh, more uh, weather resistant is is to overcome this, this problem with metals. But, uh, and then there is concrete. So there's concrete, there's clay, there is stone, and there is metal. Beyond that, uh, there isn't much else left, right? We are still not at a place where we can comfortably put plastics on the building. I know it has been done. Chrysler has done some amazing work on the West Coast with plastics on a building, but they continue to be problematic with fire. They continue to be problematic with ultraviolet degradation. They continue to be problematic with just a sheer life cycle, right? That's that plastics are polymers are the truly man-made material, and we haven't been successful in creating man-made materials that come close to these natural materials. So, so the palette is extremely limited of exterior, exterior materials. And if you say that you want to use any material that is not glass, you are going to have to do a lot of work to bring it in a place where it can be applied on the outside of a building and will withstand weathering for 50 years or 100 years or whatever it is. And it comes at a cost. So anything, even the smallest bit of addition of non-vision condition is cost. And so, on our projects, we would constantly be playing with the proportion of vision to opaque areas, and there would be a tug of war. There is some bit of it driven by performance, some bit of it driven by cost, and some bit of it driven by architectural aspiration. Well, I think about your two designs, uh, 111 West 57th and American Copper Building, and your comment about how the exterior look has to integrate with the city. 
people who I know a ton of people outside of the industry that will be able to quickly identify those buildings. So credit to you that you you really did your job in sort of and leaving the, team the mark. It's a team at in market. the city. Absolutely. The whole design team. One thing I want to ask you and and bring up because American Copper is a unitized facade that incorporated a lot of opaque areas. So I'm going to give a shout out to my friend Matt Bronski at SGH because he asks me the same question. How do we um, eliminate the misnomer that curtain wall is an all glass facade and that you can design a unitized facade assembly that still incorporates a lot of opaque materiality? Oh, um, yeah, I, I mean, both the projects you mentioned are both curtain wall projects, right? Curtain wall is simply a an intellectual framework. It, it's it's an abstract framework. It's the idea of uh, it's the idea of building a facade in a specific way where it hangs outside um, the edge of slab. Uh, but you could you could build it with any materials, right? We have tended to focus more and more in using aluminum extrusions to create the performative part of the curtain wall. Because aluminum extrusions, uh, the method of extrusion, the material that is aluminum and its specific properties um, has enabled the most inexpensive, state-of-the-art ability to create high-performance building enclosures that are assembled on site, that are, that are interlocked on site, right? That interlocking on site is critical to the idea of unitization. Even uh, in any method of uh, of prefabrication of facade and pieces, uh, putting aside precast because precast is one that still relies on wet seals, right? So precast you put that aside, but steel panelized systems, which was sort of pioneered by island uh, fabricators and then taken up by a number of others, even they did not start out, they sort of started out in the world of, uh, of wet seals like the precast, but they very quickly learned that at the edges that they put aluminum extrusions that allowed a proper interlock and a pressure equalized ceiling, it significantly enhances the performance of the project, of, of their facade. So this using of interlocking aluminum extrusions, if, if you can figure out a way to do that behind any material you want to use, you're golden, right? And in principle, it would all fall under the world of unitization, and it does not really have anything to do with whether you're using glass or not. And it doesn't have, uh, and unitization works best in a curtain wall scenario because a curtain wall being outside the slab edge is continuous. So it, it gives you a continuous line of fully tested, designed facade. As soon as you start putting your facade between the slab edges like a window wall, you are creating breaks in the continuity of the facade and now you're compartmentalization bringing, right yeah you're bringing in more points of failure or you bring in more side ceiling so and and this is not to you know say that window wall is never applicable or never as good or comparable you know there are projects where window wall works best but if if you're talking about curtain wall as as a uh, as a framework to build a facade uh, it is not it, it is not tied to any material expression or it is not tied to um, any, you know, it's not tied to cost even. I have done really inexpensive curtain walls and I have done very expensive window walls as well. So I guess, yeah, your appetite for different materiality, whether it's brick, stone, metal, you can incorporate that in either, as you said, a, a precast inlay panel or a mega panel system, which are both outboard of the slab and just are set on the slab with your typical P anchor or welded connection. So both utilize curtain wall technology, but still can be highly opaque facades. Absolutely. But you know, uh, there was a project that Sharp did in early in 2015, 2016 on the Upper East Side. It's called, it's on 91st Street and First Avenue, I think. Uh, I don't know what it's called now, but it was uh, the client was Anbao, um, and we did, and they wanted it to be a brick building. It was a, I think, a 37-story residential tower, and. Um, there, uh, there was a lot of discussion and debate because they wanted a brick expression because of the neighborhood and being contextual. And uh, we studied that through um, thin brick applied as a part of window wall. We studied it as precast concrete with uh, thin brick applied to the face of precast. But what we ended up with was hand laid brick on a block work back backing, right? And window wall inserts 
within mm -hmm. the rough openings that were done by Pioneer. Um, but it was it was an interesting uh, sort of process of education for me, I remember, um, because I, you know, it was sort of the first time that I had done a multi-story um, handled brick project and had always sort of dismissed that method um, as something that did not belong to high-rise construction or did not belong to modern performance or or the the, the state of labor costs and, and uh, sort of the general logistical challenges of building in the city. I had always just shut that out. But working on the project, we we set ourselves this goal. We said, we're going to explore every realistic project method of building as far as we can take it before we put it away. Like we're not going to bring any preconceived notions. And so we we contacted IMI, you know, the International Masonry Institute that's based in Long Island City, and they brought in bricklayers into our office. And we sat and we had these amazing discussions to understand what the state of bricklayers' work was in, in today's times and what made them tick. And, and then we brought in precaster. I remember Guy Tremblay who used to be with BPDL at that time, and he came and he sat and spoke about precast at length and how they would fulfill this. And we realized that the choice between precast versus handled brick is not about materiality or cost. It is almost always about logistics and whether you have the place to park very long um, trailer trucks outside your site and pick up a facade panel or precast panel directly, or whether you're better off hanging a hanging scaffold that travels up to install brick. And, and on know, the flip side of that, I know a lot of markets where architects have an appetite to use hand laid, but they just don't have the local labor force or masons. That too. And, and you know, so interestingly, as, as we did more research and we spoke to uh, we spoke to a number of window wallers at that time. And eventually what went into our bid set was something that had already been vetted out. We did not draw an architecture set where we left it for the industry to figure out how they wanted to give us that project because we knew that we would lose control of this project as soon as we did that. Mm -hmm. We did not want it to be an open question when the project hit the market because everyone will start proposing their own value engineering, and suddenly there is no apples to apples comparison left anymore. So where where is your comfort zone now, now that you sort of came full circle and you still stay true to being a facade specialist, got sort of your your time and was able to sort of play in that architecture community and role? Is is your comfort zone or where you thrive in, in a role where you're able to work directly for an architecture firm? Or do you like being that bridge and working directly for an owner? Um, it does not make much difference for us. You know, I think that uh, we have, we currently are working for both. Um, and uh, really, uh, you know, it, it really, it makes really no difference as far as I'm concerned. I think that what is important, uh, you know, I'm not even really uh, too concerned about how, large or smaller project is, or whether the project can afford an expensive facade or a cheap facade. Because there is no expensive or cheap facade. There is really only the most appropriate facade, right? And for every project, there is a very small window of appropriateness, you know, based on all of its, you know, um, all of its pieces of the puzzle that are around it. And our purpose is to help find, discover that, that window of appropriateness. And it doesn't matter whether uh, an owner is uh, hiring us or an architect is hiring us. What is really important is that we do not want to stand on the fences, simply producing technical solutions to whatever the architects may be imagining. We want to simultaneously take the conversation into the world of discovering the preferred procurement strategy or the preferred, uh, you know, if, 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 if there is a specific factor that is going to affect the, the the risk profile of this project when it hits the market. We need to discover all of that. We're not here to simply draw a technical detail, write the specification and say, let us know when you have a contractor. I think that we are we as specialists would not be fulfilling our full role if we did not engage ourselves and help everyone, whether it's the owner or the general contractor or the architect or the structural engineer, navigate and get their own work aligned correctly to get a successful facade at the end. It's wonderful. Where's the uh, the best place for people to reach out to you, Samir? Um, I, I mean, my website is techne.pro. My, uh, you know, I am 
quite uh, quite present on LinkedIn. Uh, my own website is Kumar at Techne.pro. So either any any of that. Awesome. I really appreciate you hopping on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And it was a pleasure. Thank you for allowing me to talk so much. Of course. Cheers. Thanks. Yes.